In the first installment of this series, we introduced the idea of polarity, more commonly known as duality. And that led us quickly to one of those boundaries that modern scientific thought confronts us with. For the polarity to be consistent, we need to pass through infinity. The infinitely distant cannot be perceived. It cannot be pictured. But it can be clearly thought. We distinguish perception, mental picture, and concept. And already, we have the most secure foundation for spiritual science. Initial clarity concerning body, soul, and spirit. For the geometry established by Euclid and the mind-soul, there are limits. The modern consciousness soul proceeds right through the limits and continues calmly. It is a kind of initiation when you can say, I myself go to the breaking point and continue. The first installment introduced the infinitely distant point of the line. This point lies in opposite directions simultaneously. Thus the line is completed. It becomes a closed curve, but straight, a circle with zero curvature. Here are seven circles, or strictly speaking, imperfect representations of circles. We can see four of them. We can complete two more of them with a little effort in visualization. The one in the middle is an infinitely expanded circle. Try picturing all of this as one circle in steady change. Start, if you will, with the circle in its yellow state. As its center moves out to the right, the circle grows. When the center is infinitely distant, it is present both on the right and on the left. And the circle passes through its straight, magenta version. The center continues to migrate in the same direction and approaches from the left. And the circle shrinks. Can we also picture an infinitely large sphere with its center infinitely distant? Visualize the corresponding development. You could use this same picture to do so, if you take it three-dimensionally. Or make your own mental image. Advanced draftsmen might manage to draw it. For all of you skeptics, here is a photograph to prove that parallel lines really do meet in the infinite distance. And here is another. That's right, the reflection of a straight line on a sphere is a circle. Same as the reflection of a circle. Because it is a circle. Here, the floor only offers line segments, so the reflections are arcs of circles. But if you have enough ink to draw an infinitely long straight line, it will reflect on any convex curved surface as a closed curve. Here we see a black X in the middle of the picture. It is standing next to that candle on the left. The candle casts the shadow of the X on the surface of the table. Any point of the shadow is, of course, collinear with the candle flame and the corresponding point of the X. The red segment shows this for the center of the shadow. 
Now as the candle burns down, what happens to the shadow? Feel free to pause and imagine it. Or draw it. You can try this with a real candle, too, or whatever other light source. Ahriman, to use the anthroposophical term, wants to destroy time in order to conquer space. We want to practice thinking geometrical figures in movement in order to reunite the world of fixed form with its etheric origin in a kind of consecration of space. Whoops! What is happening to the shadow? Parallel lines are the shadow of an X. They cross in the infinite distance. And since we are living in the age of the consciousness soul, there is no need to stop at this threshold. Can you picture what happens when the candle burns lower than the center of the X? Feel free to pause and test yourself. The upward light casts the center of the shadow through the infinite distance and onto the bottom of the table. Did we mention that this table is transparent? You will need a strong flashlight to achieve this effect at home. Let's keep going. This is not good for your table. The candle has burned all the way down. But why stop? We calmly proceed through thresholds. The candle has just slipped below the surface of the table. This particular table has a thickness of zero and is now casting its light downward to the left. The candle is growing downward from the surface of the table. It's about negative four inches tall. When it, be when it becomes infinitely long, this happens. Last time, we practiced this visualization in two dimensions. Now we can try it again in three. Consider each of these lines as the image of a plane seen from the side. The blue plane stays put. The green plane rotates. They intersect in a straight line, which we see here end on in red. The farther the green plane rotates away from the perpendicular, the faster the line speeds off to the side. When it passes through the infinite distance, it is present in all directions. Then it returns from the other side. Now a question may arise. Given two parallels, with their shared point at infinity and two other parallels in the same plane, not parallel to the first pair, does the second pair have a different infinitely distant point? How do you know? Because they already intersect the first pair right here. See Proposition 1b from the first installment. Two coplanar lines share exactly one point. That means each family of parallels has its own infinitely distant point. That is why any but the simplest perspective drawing requires more than one vanishing point. Next question. Do the infinitely distant points of all the lines in a plane connect in a circle? Remember, each line has exactly one infinitely distant point. 
So the shape joining all the infinitely distant points meets each line exactly once. What shape meets each line in a plane exactly once? That's right, a straight line. The plane has exactly one infinitely distant line. A line has one infinitely distant point. A plane has one infinitely distant line. The image cast by the infinitely distant line is the horizon where parallels meet. And by the same reasoning, space has one infinitely distant plane, which intersects every other plane exactly once namely, at its infinitely distant line. Now for some exercises to become familiar with infinity. How would you mark the location of an infinitely distant point? Here is a good notation. The direction is indicated. Now copy this drawing onto a piece of paper, if you will, and apply Proposition 1A. Any two points share exactly one line. In other words, connect P and Q. Pause now if you like. Did you get that right? Next exercise. Draw a triangle and imagine one corner traveling out along one of the sides. What will the figure look like when the corner reaches infinity and then when it returns from the other side? You can do this one on your own. It helps to draw it. Draw it in stages and imagine it in continual transformation. It's easier if you let it travel out an inch before it travels out a mile. For those of you who live in countries that still use the metric system, that means let it travel out 2.54 centimeters before it travels out slightly less than 1.61 kilometers. Draw a so-called complete quadrangle and imagine one of the seven corners traveling out along one of the sides. Let us say that the two corners marked in black do not move. Which ones do? What will the figure look like when the red corner reaches infinity and then when it returns from the other side? See how vigorously and precisely you can picture the transformation. And then test yourself by drawing it, if you like. Advanced challenge. What if two of the corners decided to go for a walk simultaneously? Next exercise. Draw three planes forming a prism. Where is their shared point? Draw three planes forming an H. Where are their three shared lines? Where is their shared point? After the definitions, at the beginning of Book 1 of the Elements, Euclid states the five fundamental requirements for mind-soul planar geometry. Be it postulated. To draw a straight line from any point to any point. Easy. And to extend a finite straight line continuously 
in a straight line. No problem. And to draw a circle with any center and radius. Granted. And that all right angles are equal to one another. Obviously. And that if a straight line intersecting two straight lines makes the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles, the two straight lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on that side on which are the angles less than the two right angles. Got that? Hmm. That's Greek for parallels don't meet. He found he needed this assumption to build his proofs on. Later geometers looked at these five postulates and said, one of these things is not like the others. The first four are clean, simple, and immediately obvious. The fifth seemed too obscure for such a fundamental position. Therefore, people tried for centuries to prove it. But you can't. The independence of the parallel postulate from Euclid's other axioms was finally demonstrated by Beltrami in 1868. Euclidean geometry singles out the infinitely distant as a special exception. Projective morphology treats all points equally, including the infinitely distant, and likewise all lines and all planes. Infinitely distant is a metrical term. So is parallel. Projective morphology is non-metrical. It is the science of shapes and their transformations. It does generate metrical lawfulness, but it is more fundamental than all measurement. Hence, Euclidean geometry proves to be a special limited case of projective morphology.